Hello. When I first spoke with the Polk Home and Museum about this lecture, we of course had no idea that the COVID-19 pandemic would prevent us from gathering together in person. I am so sorry that that could not happen this fall, but I am very glad to be able to use these digital platforms to be able to share this story with you despite that circumstance. My name is Katherine Hughes, and I recently moved to Tennessee from New York, where I was working as a two-year research scholar with the American Wing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art on an upcoming exhibition on the 19th century stoneware of Edgefield District, South Carolina. Much of the research I am going to share with you now comes out of my work with the Met over the past two years. In 2018, and then again in 2019, I visited the site of a former 19th century pottery in Edgefield County, South Carolina. All that is left today of this once massive pottery production can be seen in these images I'm now sharing. It's an area that is now owned, managed, and protected by the Cultural Heritage Trust, part of South Carolina's Department of Natural Resources. But as you can see, there's just broken pottery all over the ground. The site was bulldozed in the 20th century. Apparently, the ruins of the pottery kiln had become home to a snake pit, and the landowners at the time didn't really like that. And so, while there are no standing structures remaining, archaeology in the past 10 years or so has mapped out the site. The property, which consists of about 150 to 160 acres, includes roads, the pottery kiln, the waster pile, clay pits, as well as the remains of both the slave dwellings and the pottery owner's family homestead. And bear with me for a moment, but I'd like for us to try and picture the pottery production as it was in the 1850s. Let's say April 21st, 1858. It was a Wednesday. There's activity going on all over the property because a kiln firing is going to take place soon. The brick kiln has to be constructed and it is going to be at least 80 feet in length. When it is ready to be fired, someone is going to be made to crawl into that long dark space, cramped and unable to stand, to place the pots that are ready for firing. But before that happens, the clay for the pottery is being dug and transported and then the clay actually has to be ground with the use of a pug mill, probably with a mule that's being led in a circle. Then the glazes for the finished pots have to be prepared and the throwing of the actual pots and then glazing them and then stacking the finished ware in the kiln, cutting the timber for fuel, stoking the kiln during the firings. And then still to come is the unloading of the kiln once the firing is complete and carrying the wares to town for sale. But on this day in 1858, there's a man of African descent, born in South Carolina at the turn of the last century, around 1800, and now he's just shy of 60 years old. He has a wooden stump in place of a leg he lost when he was a young man, but he is still very strong, and that's partly because he has this incredible skill as a master stoneware potter. It can be very hot in South Carolina, even in April, yet he's still able to take these huge hunks of heavy, damp clay and throw them on a potter's wheel, shaping them into storage jars that could hold 25 or 30 gallons of beef or pork or lard. This enslaved man spends April 21st, 1858, throwing pots on a wheel working up the damp clay with his skilled hands, creating jars, jugs, churns, maybe a few bowls. His whole day is spent bent over the potter's wheel he works at, his hands working the clay, creating functional ceramic objects that will be fired in the kiln, and then packed onto a train traveling the South Carolina Railroad to be sold to merchants, planters, and people all over the state to be used in their kitchens and pantries and smokehouses. But on this Wednesday, when he finishes his work for the day, this man goes over to the shelves where his work of the past few days is drying and waiting for the kiln firing, 
and with a sharpened stylus, perhaps, he goes over to one of the storage jars, a larger one, and he writes, this jar is to Mr. Siegler, who keeps the bar in Orangeburg, for Mr. Edwards, a gentleman, who formerly kept Mr. Thomas Bacon's horses. And below that, he dates it, April 21, 1858. And then, on the opposite side, he writes, Fill this jar with pork or beef, Scott will be there to get a piece, spelled P-E-A-C-E. -E. And underneath that, he writes his name, Dave. Probably the best known name associated with 19th century Edgefield stoneware is that of David Drake, otherwise known as Dave. He was an African-American man born in South Carolina about 1801, who was an immensely talented potter, as well as being literate. And that's really important to this story, because during Dave's life in antebellum South Carolina, it was illegal for an enslaved person to know how to read or write, and anti-literacy laws in South Carolina became even more stringent in 1834 with the passing of the slave literacy law. Just to give some context, this is the same time that James K. Polk is chair of the House of Representatives. And it is also just about the same time that we start to see pots that were being made by Dave inscribed with his name, with the date, and then on occasion with a word or verse or poem. Dave lived and worked in Old Edgefield District, which was located on the southwest border of South Carolina, where it abuts Georgia, over near Augusta. The town of Edgefield still exists today, as does Edgefield County, but when I say Old Edgefield District, I mean the much larger area that was mapped out in 1825 in Robert Mills's Atlas in South Carolina, and that in the years after the Civil War was split into five different counties. So we're talking about a very large area. Edgefield District is squarely on the map of Southern decorative arts today due to this monumental 19th century pottery production, a legacy which could never have been built without the enslaved and free African Americans who provided the labor for this endeavor. Over the course of the 19th century, there were about 20 or so potteries that operated in the district, and at their height of production, each manufactory produced about 30 to 50,000 gallons of pottery each year. The ceramics made in Edgefield range from enigmatic face vessels to David Drake's massive storage jars incised with poetry and signatures. This could not have been done without enslaved labor. What you're seeing on the screen now is just a smattering of what 19th century Edgefield stoneware can look like, but I think it gives a great idea of the many different forms and sizes and shapes and glazes that can be found comprising this material. These objects are from a number of different collections, both in public museums as well as private collections, and every object currently on the screen, with the exception maybe of the face vessels towards the top, is a utilitarian object one that was made with a definite function and use in mind. Now, even though these objects were made with a specific working purpose, and even though this story springs from a very specific time and place in South Carolina history, the story of 19th century Edgefield stoneware pottery is that of a true American art form. And I think that that is what continues to strike me so emphatically about the story of Edgefield District stoneware that it is often this melding of creative expression and functionality, and it can speak to so many aspects of American history. But why was this pottery production in Edgefield such a massive enterprise? There are many reasons. In order to really understand why this pottery production is so innovative and becomes so monumental, out in what is really backcountry South Carolina at the very start of the 19th century, we need to go back for a minute and give you a better understanding of the place that we are talking about. So, going back to this 1825 map for a moment, 
you can actually see two different potteries referenced. And the one that you see pulled out on the top, Landrumsville, also known as Pottersville, is thought to really be the first pottery that begins in the area, around 1810. And one of the things that happens at Pottersville and Edgefield in the 1810s is that the receipt or recipe for alkaline glaze, which is previously only known in Asia, shows up for the first time in North America. And it happens in Edgefield, South Carolina. And there are many reasons that pottery and ceramics become this super successful endeavor in this area in particular. And it's a combination of politics and current events and trade and commerce combined with the geology of the area, uh, the clay and the kaolin that's available. That's a lump of kaolin that you're seeing on the screen there uh, that I'm holding. And the availability of certain kinds of hardwoods for firing these pottery kilns and a number of other factors including all this new technology that's being used, both in terms of the glazes, but then also the actual pottery kilns and how they are being built. And so this image here on the screen now doesn't look like much, but it's actually a huge key to our current understanding of Edgefield's 19th century pottery production. This is a 2011 image of an archeological excavation that was being conducted at that time. And the result of this work was the discovery that the kiln built at Pottersville, the earliest pottery site in Edgefield that we know of, was actually well over 100 feet long. To put this into perspective, most kilns in America in the early 19th century are roughly 10 to maybe 30 feet in length at most. This discovery, which would not have been possible without the work of archaeologists, is really mind-blowing on many levels. But the one that I really want to focus on at this moment is that if you are working with a hundred foot pottery kiln, the amount of labor that is needed to build that kiln, create the pots that then have to be loaded into it, and then fire that kiln and keep it at firing temperature for multiple days is enormous. And that's really the crux of how and why the Edgefield pottery production achieved the scale and success that it did at this time. Because in addition to everything else, the labor was available and it was free because the labor force was mostly made up of enslaved African Americans. So why does this matter and how does it connect to James K. Polk? The stoneware production that comes out of Edgefield District is really developed and established during the height of Polk's political career in the 1830s and 40s. This is when glazes and the kaolin and iron oxide slip trail decoration is being experimented with and perfected, and also when we first start seeing stoneware that is written on and signed by David Drake, like these pieces here from the Harvard Art Museums and the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. And I do think that the answer as to why we should care about some old jar or jug is the same reason why any material culture is important at all which is that it's important because objects can hold history that is not otherwise found in the documentary record. Objects can hold history and they can tell stories and they can hold memory. An object from 100, 200, 500 years ago holds the stories of those who made it, those who used it, those who cleaned it and cared for it and whose hands it passed through. And clay and ceramics are especially like this. You're talking about a material that literally comes from the earth that is formed and thrown and shaped by human hand. One of the really phenomenal things about the 19th century Edgefield stoneware and the fact that it was being made for this functional utilitarian everyday use is that it didn't have to be perfectly smooth and finished. And that's why you're able to find thumbprints and fingerprints and hand marks all over this stuff in the clay, in the glaze, where the potter formed the handles, where they shaped the neck of the jar, where they held the pot to dip it upside down into the glaze or held it to pour glaze over it. There is a direct connection when you handle these jars and jugs and pots and you can feel how the potter shaped the clay. And it's really something that's amazing because it's this direct connection to the past and it's a reminder of the humanity incorporated into these objects. These objects are the connection we have to the people of the past. And without them, we wouldn't know nearly as much about Dave's story or those of the other enslaved potters and craftspeople who worked with him, 
who oftentimes don't have as much of a presence in the documentary record. And I love using this particular image showing both the fingerprints on Edgefield pottery, but also showing those that can be found on 19th century bricks, because it just re-emphasizes how you can find signs of human connection everywhere you look throughout history. So David Drake's life can be traced through sale and census records, as well as the dates that he wrote on his work. But it can also be traced through his voter registration in 1867 at the Edgefield County Public Courthouse, where he writes his name as David Drake. And this courthouse is still standing in the town square, across from the memorial to the Confederate dead and another to Edgefield's own Strom Thurmond, the South Carolina senator and politician who fought for segregation well into the 20th century. And that's the thing about Edgefield. It is wrapped up in so many different histories and is such a juxtaposition of literacy and agency and resistance and freedom along with this large scale industrial slavery and an incredible amount of violence towards African Americans during reconstruction and then well into the 20th century. And the reason I'm saying this all is because you really have to look at these objects in the context in which they were made. Which is why when I talk about 19th century Edgefield stoneware, I always try to be careful not to end the story at the close of the Civil War, because it doesn't end there. Edgefield becomes a hotbed of violence during the years of Reconstruction, but before the terrors of groups like the KKK and the Red Shirts fully infiltrated the area, newly emancipated African Americans took steps to ensure that their skills, so long used for the sole benefit of others, would continue to be of use to them. So this here is an 1866 Freedmen's Bureau contract that exists between B.F. Landrum and six newly emancipated African Americans named in the document as Simon, Dave, Sam, Celia, Kitty, and Ann, who are, quote, employed in the manufacture of stoneware, end quote. The contract states that B.F. Landrum will give each person a certain number of gallons of stoneware, that he will furnish the wagon and team to carry the ware to Augusta, Georgia, provide them with rations, and feed and clothe Jim, Wash, and Adam, boys, for their services. In exchange, the six adults agree to do regular and faithful work, and Simon agrees to turn what is known as the long day's work, a boy being furnished to assist him. Edgefield's population during the antebellum period consisted of an enslaved African-American labor force that allowed for pottery production on a massive scale, but also a population of skilled artisans and laborers left in the area post-emancipation who already held the knowledge and experience of this type of pottery production. And while I know that I'm veering about 20 plus years past President Polk's lifetime, I think it is important to keep in mind that, not, that the 19th century is an age of great change and upheaval, and the first half of the century, including Polk's presidency itself, lays the groundwork for the next 50 years to come. Today, museums, collectors, and scholars are discovering a renewed interest in the 19th century alkaline glazed stoneware made in Edgefield District. The large 1858 storage jar by David Drake is a recent addition to the Civil War and Reconstruction Gallery in the Met's American Wing, and really brings that space to life, adding a whole new dimension. Of course, I can't help but wonder what Dave would think of his work now on display at the Met in a space alongside paintings by Winslow Homer and Thomas Aiken, but I'd like to think that he'd be happy about it. Despite my love for beautiful things, their beauty is not the reason I work with the decorative arts. For me, it has always been about the human stories that objects can illuminate. Alkaline glazed stoneware can be aesthetically beautiful, but it is the human history and hands that have been the driving inspiration behind my interest in these objects. Decorative art scholarship that focuses on the humanity of the people surrounding the object, whether they are the makers, commissioners, sellers, owners, or craftspeople, is essential to our understanding of the objects themselves. The story of Edgefield pottery should not be boxed into just being art history, 
or just being Southern history, or even just being Black history. It is the story of America. When I look at these 19th century alkaline glazed stoneware pieces from Edgefield District, South Carolina, interspersed with art from the rest of the Mets American Wing collection, I believe it all looks right at home together, and that these Edgefield jars and jugs are helping to tell a far more inclusive American story, adding new narratives and perspectives to old ways of thinking. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share this research and hopefully give some insight into another small slice of Polk's America.